fascinating fossils, the frightening but awesome sea scorpion. God has filled our world with many amazing creatures. When you consider all of the animals living today, and then add to that all of the creatures that we know only from the fossil record, and add to those um, animals that have become extinct in historic times, well, the numbers are astonishing, and the diversity boggles my mind. I look closely at rocks and stones on my daily walks and have found many fossils, some quite rare, but always fascinating. The fossil I'm about to tell you about now I found in Saginaw, Michigan, but it is almost certain that this exotic creature never lived here. What I found on my walk was a small example of a sea scorpion, also known by the very difficult to pronounce name, Yuri Pitrid. This specimen measures about one inches in length, and the matrix that it's in measures an inch and a half by an inch and a half by one inch. This is a fossil specimen when you, uh, small specimen I should say, when you consider um, that some grew in length taller than an adult um, human male. Some grew up to eight feet in length. The Uripetrid are an extinct group of arthropods uh, that are related to the arachnids or spiders and uh, include the largest knowing, known arthropods to have ever lived. They are members of the extinct order <coughs> of Uripetrid uh, which is the most diverse group of Paleozoic chel chelrate in uh, terms of species. The sea scorpion varied greatly in size, with the largest known fossil specimen measuring some 8 feet in length. Most species, however, were less than 8 inches, such as the one which I have found and I'm showing you in the slide presentation that goes along with this. They were very formidable predators who survived and thrived in a shallow warm waters in both seas and lakes from the mid ordovician to the late Permian period. While I follow the biblical dating of the uh, earth being very young, science claims these to have lived between 460 to 248 million years ago. Although informally called sea scorpions, only the earliest ones were marine, later ones lived in brackish or fresh water, and they were not true scorpions. According to accepted theory, the move from sea, sea to fresh water probably occurred in the Pennsylvanian era. The sea scorpion went extinct during the Permian Triassic extinction event some 252 million years ago, according to secular science. They were widespread with uh, near worldwide distribution. There are about two dozen families of sea scorpion known, and in 1825 they were described by zoologist James Ellsworth Decay. He recognized the arthropod nature of the first ever sea scorpion specimen, which was found by Dr. S. L. Mitchell. In 1984, the uh, species known as the Uripetrus. Um, was named as the first state fossil of New York. Yuri petrids have been described as follows. Typically, they had large, flat, semicircular caprice, um, followed by a jointed section, finally tapering to a flexible tail, most uh, ending with a, a long spine at, at the very end, though some had a large flat tail, possibly with a similar spine. Behind the head are 12 body segments, each of, each of which was formed from a dorsal plate. The tail is spiked in most specimens, just as the tail of a modern scorpion that lives on land. Some species may have used it to inject venom, but there is no certain evidence that the sea scorpion was a venomous creature. Most species had paddles toward the end of their carapace, uh, which were used to propel themselves through the water. A suborder, style Anvarina, had walking legs rather than paddles. Underneath, in addition to the pair of uh, swimming appendages, the creature had four pairs of jointed legs for walking, as well as two claws in the front. Other features common to ancient and modern arthropods of this type include one pair of compound eyes and a pair of smaller eyes located between the larger pair of compound eyes. Many of the Uripetrids had large and long enough legs with, uh, which were probably used for terrestrial movement, such as in land crabs uh, of our time. And some species are in, indeed believed to have been amphibians uh, emerging onto land as part, of their, as part of their regular life cycle. 
Uripetrids are considered to be close relatives of the horseshoe crab, as also is the trilobite, which is now extinct also. And other studies show them to be closer to the arachnids and uh, that they are closely related to land-living scorpions. An interesting thing about this small rock um, with the Uripetrid fossil on it that I found is if you, if you turn it over, um, as you'll see in my photos here, there is a, a second fossil showing part of a creature which has a jagged, almost like t a ripped edge to it. And I've had uh, some difficulty trying to figure out exactly what that is. Um, it looks, though, um, to be uh, the side of a trilobite. Uh, which coexisted in the oceans with the Uripetrids. Uh, but as you look at it, if you have uh, any thoughts about um, what it may be, please put them in the comment sections as I would be very happy to hear um, what you have to say. And again, I encourage you as you're out walking, watch the rocks and stones because you never know what amazing um, relic and fossil from the past that you might turn up. Fascinating Fossils, a Fossil Caterpillar from Saginaw, Michigan by Dennis M. Morrison. You know, in the insect world, I have to say I love caterpillars. Some of them can be creepy, some of them can be kind of, you know, a little bit disgusting, but I love caterpillars because they're colorful and some are even fuzzy, though. The, they call them the woolly bears that come out in the, in the fall. Um, anyways, there's just an amazing diversity of forms in the caterpillars and there are some pretty amazing things about how God created them too. For example, as a small as small as a caterpillar is, it can have as many, are you ready for this, as 4,000 muscles in its body. By comparison and considering the difference in size, human beings have only about 640 named muscles. And before the caterpillar uh, pupates, it will increase its body weight by as much as 1,000 times or more and amazingly, this is in a period of only weeks. Caterpillars have 12 eyes, and they actually produce silk. Both the caterpillar and the adult butterfly have six legs and <clears throat> make uh, and move in a wave-like motion from back to front. If you've never watched them, you have to. It's absolutely astounding. God gave them a wide variety of, of uh, methods of defending themselves. Some caterpillars, like the black swallowtail, look like bird droppings. Some look like twigs. And some advertise just how toxic they are by their very brilliant colors. Some even have what looks like huge eyes, eye spots on them to make themselves look more intimidating to a predator. And a specific swallowtail caterpillar can be identified by its smell. It has a distinctive stink gland just behind the head. Caterpillars are the larval form of members of the order of Lepido <laughs> here we go, Lepido Lepidontra, which includes both butterflies and moths. I knew I was going to screw that word up. Uh, because most <clears throat> are plant eaters, they are considered pests to farmers and producers of fruit. 
The caterpillar has been around, though, for a long time and has remained pretty much unchanged. I was, however, rather surprised when I found this specimen in red shale here in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, I found this near the Shiawassee Wildlife Res Reserve, and if you've watched um, many of my videos, you'll know that the shale here, um, well, let me back up, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, coal was mined at um, this particular site, as well as many others throughout the county. Coal production was a thriving industry, and to reach the coal underground, um, the miners had to go through layers of fossil-bearing shale. The shale from this site ranges from black salmon and uh, gray. Most of the fossils found in the shale here are of plants dating to the Pennsylvania era or Carboniferous forests. On rare occasion, a fossil such as this caterpillar turns up. These are rare because the soft body tissue did not lend itself to fossilization, especially with thousands of pounds of sedimentary uh, debris squashing down on them. Conditions had to be just perfect for the fossilization process to take place. It had to happen quickly or the soft body would decay. This specimen was collected in the summer of 2013 by Dennis M. Morrison Sr. and Professor Dan Collins, lying exposed on the top of a 40-foot high pile of shale, which is the only visible reminder of the coal mining operations in that particular area. As you look closely at the pieces of shale, you never know what you might find, anything from ferns, calamites, scale trees, seed pods, and insects. It is a great reflection of what life was like here way back in the day when this area would have been close to the equator. I've been told by some witnesses that the mine shaft actually um, went under, goes under the Titabwasi River in several places, also by the Shiawassee Wildlife um, Refuge, and that a, a few people um, have been allowed to go down there and have actually said that as you look up at the top of the mine shafts um, where the shale is, that it looks almost like um, an ancient forest laying, just, you know, just laying scattered where, where everything was laid flat when the floods came during Noah's time. Fascinating Fossils, the Ch Sigillaria Tree by Dennis M. Morrison. <clears throat> As you can probably tell if you've looked at very many of my videos, I, I love fossils. And I recently did a video on a very fine fossil specimen that I found, um, a specimen of Lepidodendron bark. Well, the Lepidodendron has a close cousin growing at the same time, and that is the Sigillaria Tree, and it grew in the Carboniferous Forests of the Pennsylvanian era. The Sigillaria is an extinct, spore-bearing, arborescent tree, um, tree-like plant that flourished, as I already said, in the late Carboniferous period. And by the early Permian period, it was extinct. But it is another amazing creation of the greatest scientific mind ever, and that is the God of the Holy Bible. The Sigillaria is related to the um, lycopsids, or club mosses, but even more closely related to the quillwort. This was a tall tree-like plant with an occasionally forked trunk that lacked wood. Um, support came from a, la uh, a layer of closely packed leaf bases just below the surface of the trunk, while its center was filled with pith. <clears throat> the old leaf bases expanded as the trunk grew in width and um, left a diamond-shaped pattern, which is evident in the fossils and which is similar to the pattern left on the lepidodendron uh, tree bark fossils. The trunk had photosynthetic tissue on the surface, meaning it was probably green. Some of the bark fossil displays a surface with vertical styrations, such as the awesome large specimen, which I found, which there's a picture um, towards the end of this video. It's very difficult to photograph it. It's under glass, and it's, uh, and it's very, very black. Um, 
So, but anyway, the trunk of the tree was topped with a plume of, of um, long grass-like leaves so that the plant looked somewhat like a uh, tall forked uh, bottle brush. The plant bore its spores in cone-like structures attached to the stem. The sigillaria, like many ancient lycopods, had a relatively short life cycle growing rapidly and reaching maturity in but a few years. It is believed that the sigillaria died after reproduction. However, this has not been proven. It grew <clears throat> in the Carboniferous forest, as I said, of the late Pennsylvanian era, along with the Lepidodendron, or the scale tree, and other plants such as the calamite. Now, as you can see in my photo, the photos, the sigillaria bark um, exhibits straight, fluted furrows along the trunk midsection. Occasionally, the trunks were um, completely smooth. A difference between this and the close cousin, the lepidodendron, can be found in its uh, reproductive cones. The lepidodendron cones were attached singularly um, near the tip of its branches. However, the sigillaria cones occurred in clusters attached in certain places along the upper stem. Now, this tree-like plant attained heights of as much as 130 feet tall. When this plant, <clears throat> represented by my fossil specimen, was alive in what would one day be Saginaw, Michigan, Saginaw would have been close to the equator. During the Carboniferous period, a large portion of Europe and North America was on the equator. The warm and consistently humid climate was ideal for the growth of extensive swampy forests where this type of plant thrived. The Pacific Basin was the largest, carb largest Carboniferous Basin, which comprised regions of what is, are now Ireland, England, North France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Poland. What I'm going to say next is scientific theory, and I disagree with most of it as I support 100% the flood of Noah's day. The flood is fact, <clears throat> and it's borne out in the fossil record throughout the world. Whether you accept the flood fact for the deposit of sediments or science's claims, we know these fossils were formed by being buried in heavy layers of sediment. Now, the scientific theory has it that um, periodic changes in the sea levels caused the rivers that trans trans traversed the forest to flood, depositing massive amounts of sand and mud, thereby burying the forests so that were along the banks. In a period of one million years, several thousand meters of sediment would be deposited densely, packing and pressing the abundant vegetation into flattened rock fossil impressions. Abundant vegetation in these forests included the sigillaria, lepidodendron, and calamites. Science always uses millions of years as a magic formula to make changes happen, and this is wrong. It's never been proven to be right. The flood happened quite rapidly and had the same effect in short time as the so-called and alleged millions of years the flooding rivers allegedly had. Let's look for a moment at, at the earth before the flood, and this is going in a direction that <clears throat> I hadn't intended to, but much has changed and is um, clearly in contrast to what evolutionists teach in order to discredit God and rob him of the glory due him. You see, in Genesis 2.6, <clears throat> the Bible states emphatically, that in the days um, of Eden and shortly thereafter, that the world was watered by a mist that came up out of the ground. It wasn't watered by rain. Rain had never fallen on planet Earth up until the flood. Okay, So that's why it was so impressive when uh, the flood was over and the rainbow appeared in the sky that this this was a promise made of God and people were held in awe by it because they'd never seen a rainbow before. It had never rained, so there was never a rainbow. The fact is that at before the before the flood of Noah, when the floodgates of the heavens were open and, and the depths um, were let loose, that the earth was completely enclosed in a canopy of vapor, which caused um, a greenhouse type effect on the planet, which meant that um, that plants grew luxuriously and abundantly and large. And there was a wide variety that, that could not exist after the flood of Noah's time because of the change in the environment, and which is why you see so many extinct species in the fossil record. The Bible is always borne out as truth. And science, when it goes against the Bible, can always be borne out as false. Thanks for taking a listen. And I'll be back with another fossil specimen soon.
Fascinating Fossils, The Lepidodendron Tree by Dennis M. Morrison Sr. Ours is indeed a beautiful world, and looking around I think two of God's favorite colors must have been green and blue. The woodlands and jungles are rich with every shade of green imaginable, and before the great flood of Noah's day, the jungles were even more luxuriant and dense than the rainforests of today, and indeed covered most of the planet, or at least that part that wasn't covered by water. The fossil record, most of which was laid down during the flood, shows a vast array of plants and animals which have become extinct. And when you consider all those ex extinct life forms, and you couple those with those that are still with us today, well, it boggles the mind. I mean the sheer creative genius of God our Heavenly Father, the God of the Bible, the true and living Word. One of the uh, really amazing plants of ancient times was the Lepodendron tree, or scale tree. The remains of this tree are abundant in the fossil record around the world, and I found some pretty special specimens right here in Saginaw, Michigan, where I live. At the close of the 1800s, coal mining was a major industry here, and to get to the coal, miners had to go through layers of shale in shades of salmon, gray, and black. That shale and some of the coal are prolific in fossil impressions of plant life that science says is some 320 million years old, and from a period named the Carboniferous Age. During this time, Saginaw, Michigan was much further south, near the equator, and the plant life was quite tropical. One of the most prolific growers is the Lepidodendron, or scale tree, and I have found, as I said, some amazing specimens here and of its bark, and the bark is quite distinctive. The Lepidodendron is an extinct genus of primitive, vascular, arborescent plant related to the lyco lycopsids, or club mosses. They frequently reached heights of 100 feet with trunks over 3.3 feet in diameter. This tree had tall, thick trunks that seldom branched, but were bifurcating branches bearing clusters of leaves. These leaves were long and narrow-looking, very much like large blades of grass. These were arranged spirally around the top. The fossil impressions are very distinct and difficult to miss. There are tightly packed diamond-shaped leaf scars left on the trunk and stems as the plant grew um, to provide the mo one of the most interesting and common of fossils from that carboniferous shale. The fossils look much like a tire track or alligator skin. Interestingly, the scars or leaf cushions were composed of green photosynthetic tissues, evidenced by the cuticle covering and being dotted with stomata, microscopic pores through which carbon dioxide from the air diffuses into the plants. Likewise, the trunks would have been green, unlike modern trees, which have scaly, non-photosynthetic, brown or gray bark. The scale tree has been likened to a great giant herb. The trunks produced very little wood, being that they were mostly soft tissue. Most of the tree's support came from the thick bark-like region. This region remained around the trunk, but did not flake and fall off like that of most modern trees. As they grew, the leaf cushions expanded to accommodate the increasing width of the trunk. The Lepidodendron seems to have lived in the wettest areas of the coal swamps that existed, again, in the Carboniferous era. era. <clears throat> they grew in dense stands, likely having as many as 1,000 to 2,000 giant club mosses per hectare. This was possible because they did not branch until they were fully grown. Much of their lives were spent as unbranched poles. Reproduction in the scale tree, interestingly, was made possible by the branches of the plant <clears throat> ending in cone-like cone -like structures. They did not produce seed um, like many modern plants. Rather, they were produced by means of elaborate, encapsulated spores. It has been estimated the, the Lepidodendron grew fairly rapidly and lived between 10 to 15 years. It is also believed that this tree was monocarpic, which means they produced only once toward the end of their life. These fossil impressions were formed as the parts of the tree <coughs> was buried under tons of sedimentary um, of sediments during the fossilization, fossilization process. Literally, they were crushed flat as a board. The fossil impressions I find here in Saginaw appeal to me on several levels, one being I love books and shale being a sedimentary rock, um, when you open the, the layers apart, it's like opening the layers of a very, very ancient volume. As already stated, the Lepidodendron is famous for the unmistakable scale-like bark. 
The plant was anchored at the base not um, by a deep root system, but by several shallow running Y-shaped branches called stigmaria. These can be seen in this photograph of a large specimen that I found here in Saginaw. The upper branches at the top of the plant terminated in a cigar-shaped cone called the Lepidust robus. Well, thanks for taking a look and listen. My next fossil video will be about um, something quite different, but that lived on the trees. It'll be about an interesting little fossil caterpillar that I also found in the red shales of ancient Saginaw.